It is good to thank you, boss. Appreciate it. It is good to see Juju and Kiki this morning. Latha, it's good to see you as always. As always. Never stop or skip a beat. I'm glad to see you here. That the Lord move your feet in this direction. We're coming from the book of Luke. If you have your packet, um, we're coming from the book. If you don't have your packet and you have your Bible, we're coming from the book of Luke, the ninth chapter, uh, the 57 through the 62nd verse. I'm just going to lift up one verse, uh, but I'm going to preach from that. If you would rise to your feet in honor of God's word. <clears throat> the ninth chapter of Luke is thick with just good stuff. And we talked about earlier in the month about carrying your cross daily. But before that, Jesus sent out his disciples to work some miracles and sent them out to do some work. And then they came back and then people weren't happy and some folks were happy. And then here we are near the end of the chapter 9. So if you ever get a chance, read chapter 9 of Luke. If you have, say amen. If you need more time, say hold up, Pastor. And it reads as follows. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let me read it one more time. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back as fit for the kingdom of God. Please be seated and pray with me. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made. And we are thankful for it, Lord. We are thankful for our basic needs being met today. You've given us health. You've given us life. You've given us strength. You've given us a roof over our head, clothes on our back, food on our tables, transportation. Lord, you've given us a job. Lord, you've given us a few nickels and a couple of dimes and maybe some dollars as well. But whatever we have, Lord, it has come from you. So, Father God, we thank you for these blessings. Father God, we thank you for reasonable health and strength, Lord. Somebody didn't wake up this morning. Lord, we pray for that family that has suffered that loss. Somebody's not feeling well this morning, but Lord, we know you're a healer. We know you're a doctor. We, we know that you are everything we need to restore our health and our vitality. But Father God, this is preaching time. I need someone today to hear your word. I need someone today to hear your word and come to faith in your word. Not on what I've preached, but on what the Bible says, Lord. On what the word of God says. What, what is put in front of them. That they grow in faith in your son, Jesus. Who said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So Father God, I'm praying for that whosoever want to give their life to Christ today. I'm giving thanks in advance for that whosoever want to know you for forgiveness of sin and for salvation of their soul. Father God, make me small, but rise up in me. Become the greater so that others can see you and come to you. Lord, we just thank you now for these and all things. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church said, amen. 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 i like to read that verse one more time. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. No man, no woman, no one looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, I like to speak from the thought this morning. Who quits on Jesus? Who quits on Jesus? Turn and smile at your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, my neighbor. Who does that? Who does that? Who quits on Jesus? Who does that? Brothers and sisters, we've all at some point have quit on Jesus. Now, you're asking that question, when have I done that? Well, we've done it when we told God we want to do what we want in our lives and not what God wants to do with us with our lives. Let me say that again. In other words, my will be done and not God's. Let, let's be honest with ourselves. Far too many Christians are quitting on Jesus. 
And the road that we are on right now, brothers and sisters, haven't even gotten difficult yet. Ms. Linnell, people out there right now, I'm talking about when real persecutions come, when you really start being harassed for the cause of Christ. Miss Sue, when people attack you, like the attacks that our Christian brothers and sisters in Egypt experience on a regular basis. A few years back, there was a bomb that went off during the Easter morning service. Knowing about it, hearing about it, having real credible evidence, Richard, about planned attacks, these Christians still went to church knowing that a bomb could explode. And one did. Or in Indonesia, Ms. Jan, while worshiping, people with machetes attacked the worshipers during the service. All because they love Jesus. Brother Paul, Brother Paul, in these verses, in these verses, Jesus will reveal each and everyone's motives. And Jesus does it, and here's the best part of what I love about our Savior. Jesus does it without shouting at people, Ms. Carol, or arguing publicly with each person. No, Jesus reveals and shows three men's true nature, their intentions, and their priorities. And Miss Tammy, if you didn't notice about Jesus, he has a way of cutting you without using a knife. You see, he uses the Holy Spirit. He uses his holy word. And in case you didn't know how the Holy Spirit is capable of doing it, Hebrews 4.12 tells us that the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit. It is a cutter of joints and marrow and is the discerner of thoughts, hearts, and intentions of your mind. You see, Brother Kevin, Jesus was speaking to the people in these verses that quit on him before even finishing the job application. They quit on Jesus before the interview was even over. They walked out of the human resources office, leaving the W-4 incomplete and unfinished. Who does that? Who quits on Jesus? Brothers and sisters, look at verses 57 through 58. And we're going to find out who does just that. Verse 57 says, and it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee wheresoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And I'd like to give you three reasons why for the Trinity to the glory of God. We see my first point. We see who quits on Jesus. People do when they're confronted with hardship. People quit on Jesus when they're confronted with hardship. You see, first they want to conform, but when things get tough, they quit because they have to give up their comforts. Miss Yvonne, we see people quit when they're confronted with hardship, but they want to conform at first when things get tough, they quit because they have to give up their comforts. Let's look at the text closely this morning. And as we go line by line, we may all find ourselves, including me, facing a mirror, pointing a finger at ourselves. Jesus meets the first man that wants to serve him. The man volunteers. Brother Kevin, he says in verse 57, Lord, I will follow thee wheresoever thou goest. Meaning, wherever you go, Lord, I'll follow Brother Jim, that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. Wow. What a commitment statement. The man was ready to conform and work for Jesus. He says, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Was he saying those words to impress Jesus? Or was he saying those words that people around might be listening, showing off, acting the part, having people begin to think, Miss Rebecca, that he has godly actions? I'll follow you, Lord, now because people are watching and may think I'm special. But here's the problem, brothers and sisters. People say a lot of things, but don't back it up with action. 
You say you love me, but you beat me. You say you never leave me, but now you're gone. You said you'd be there in sickness and in health, but at the first act you sneeze, you're out of here. Jesus wants to know this about you. He wants to know, are you ready to work for the kingdom of God? Not quit when the going gets tough. Look at the hardship in verse 58. It says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man hath not where to lay his head. You see, Kiki, Jesus is explaining in plain, simple language the hardships he and his disciples experience every day. You see, Juju, Jesus uses common examples of creatures' comforts, their basic needs, how God meets the basic needs are met by the Lord. But here's the hard part, Miss Tricia. Jesus let this man know that he doesn't have a place to lay his head. Look at the text. The Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Meaning, I'm not staying at the Holiday Inn in Galilee. I sleep anywhere and everywhere my father provides me with. Translation, I'm roughing it. And since me and my boys, these 12 disciples are roughing it too. Can you conform to our comforts that we're used to? You see, Miss Sue, Jesus wants to know one thing from each and every believer. Every true disciple, are you willing to make a real visible and verbal commitment to him. Meaning, your true commitment to Christ means you're giving up conforming to the standards of this world. Hello, somebody. Now you got to conform, watch this, y'all, to the standards of Christ. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. If you are living according to the standards and ways of this world, you're conforming to this world and serving the devil and not serving God. That's a harsh statement for somebody here this morning. That's what Jesus was telling the man who said with words he would follow Jesus wherever he would go. But he doesn't follow. You do know that when you follow Jesus, you have to pick up your cross daily. You do know when you follow Jesus, you have to take up his yoke daily. That means you have to give up your life plans. That week means your weekends, your weekdays. You have to give up your life in service for Jesus. You see, the way you live your life and the way you act out your life, there is a verbal and visible commitment to God. You back up your words with actions, living a life that is pleasing to God. You see, this commitment to Jesus becomes visible when the whole world sees it because you have presented your life holy and acceptable, living godly before the world, living in God's perfect will. But lastly, the hardship part again. 2 Timothy 3 and 12 says, all who desire, somebody say all, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You see, Charlie, that, that means is this, every believer, Charlie, will that openly follows, visibly and verbally declares that they love Jesus, will come under attack. Brothers and sisters, will you follow Jesus no matter what the cost? That's a personal question you have to ask yourself because when the hardship comes, when the real problems come, when people experience pushback from family, pushback from friends, pushback from the community they live in, will they consider to continue to follow Jesus or quit on him? When you experience this pushback because resistance to your change in your lifestyle, how you live for Christ, how you are standing for Jesus, question is, will you hold back? What's causing you to pause and not move forward in your commitment to Christ? Look at the text, verse 59 and 60 now. And he said unto me, he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. 
which leads me to my second point. Who quits on Jesus? People do when hindrances occur. People do when hindrances occur. They first make excuses why they can't serve because their priorities aren't godly. Look at the text again. Who quits on God? Who quits on Jesus? When hindrances occur, hindrances, things that get in your way or things you put in your way. First, they make excuses because their priorities aren't godly. In verse 59, Jesus initiates the invitation. He initiates the invitation. He says to him, follow me. But he says, Lord, the man's response, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Now, it may sound kind of harsh, Richard, but and it sounds like a reasonable request. Let me go bury my daddy first and then I'll follow you. But the man's father wasn't even dead yet. You see, the man was referring to his father's death in the future. In the future. We don't know if the man was going to die tomorrow, a month, a year, 10, 20, 30 years from now. What the man was talking about here is he wanted to make sure that he received his inheritance from his father first. And then he'll follow Jesus. This was an excuse. It was a pushback to commitment. A way of saying to Jesus, let me secure my money, my wealth of this world first before I commit to you spiritually. Brothers and sisters, you cannot serve God and man. Mom. Meaning, man's love for the things of this world can be, will be, and is a hindrance to you and to me. The man was more committed to getting the wealth of his earthly father than getting the wealth from his father in heaven. Brothers and sisters, there's nothing on earth that can even compare to what God has in store for his children. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard what God has in store for his children. Nothing, and I mean nothing, can compare to what God has for you and me. You see, the, amen, the excuse the man used was all about getting the things he thought were important. His spiritual priorities were out of order. He placed the importance of earthly things over heavenly things. That's having your priorities out of order. And Jesus reveals that when he says in verse 60, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus' heavenly priorities is to do what? Preach the kingdom of God. Starting now, starting today, preach the kingdom of God. But the man only wanted to do his will. Wait for his inheritance from his father's death in the future. Not working for Christ today, but waiting till later on. See, here's the problem with that. Jesus tells us in Matthew, the sixth chapter, how we should prioritize our wealth, saying, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, and lay up for treasures for yourself in heaven. Somebody say heaven. Where neither moths nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Now, here's the hard part about that. Jesus goes further on to... Totally cut to the point with us. He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Ask your neighbor, where's your treasure? You see, brothers and sisters, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Meaning, what you love more than God is where your treasure is. These are the things you put off to the side. Your secret sins. The things that yours, your will be done and not God. Because if your priorities are out of order, that's where your treasures are. But here's the thing about God. He will pull the blanket that is covering your deceit. He will pull the blanket off of your hidden agenda, over your plots, over the things that you have placed higher priority over him. 
God is a jealous God. He doesn't like competition. Whatever you consider more important than him, he will show you your sins. He'll reveal you your idols. And here's the thing what God will do for you. He'll tell you, let your idol provide for you like I do. He'll tell you, let your idol give you what you need like I do. And when God does that, watch how your idol fails you every single time. You see, God is standing at the door of your heart, the heart of every man, every woman, knocking and asking them, let me in. And he wants you to serve him. And again, here's the problem. Our spiritual priorities are turned upside down, have become so twisted that we rather serve our idols and not serve God. Have mercy. Look at the text again, verse 60. Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. What excuses are you telling God that you can't serve him? How messed up are your priorities that you can't serve God? If I hear one more person tell me how they love the Lord, how they love Jesus, but they don't come to church. They don't show up for Sunday school. They don't come to Bible study on Tuesday or Wednesday night. They don't call and check on their fellow members in church, but they want everybody to check on them. Let me be clear. You're not lying to me. You're lying to God when you say you love him. Because love is an action word. And any man that's married to a woman, you can say you love them, but you better show some action behind it. Don't forget that birthday. Don't forget that anniversary. And you better not forget Valentine's Day. Brothers, if you know what I mean, say amen. But the same person is complaining and whining about, where is God? Why ain't he helping me? You want every blessing God has to give you, but don't want to serve the God. Don't want to dedicate yourself to the God. You don't want to make God priority number one in your life. Because if the truth be known, you love the things of this world more than you love God. And because you love this world more, you quit on God. God is asking you the same question. He's asking me the same question. Where are you? Why are you not serving me? But you want every blessing from me. God hasn't quit on you. You've quit on him. Brothers and sisters, I don't have a heaven or hell to put you in. But let's be clear, God does. Because he makes this statement to everyone who priorities are wrong. Look at the text again. Man and woman, look at the text again. Let the dead bury their dead. But go you and preach the kingdom of God. Let's fall back for one second to verse 59 one more time. Jesus invited the man to follow him. That's a divine invitation. That's God seeing something in you that you don't see in yourself. He does the same thing for everyone in this world. He wants you to follow him. He wants you to serve him. So the question I have for everyone this morning is, what are you going to do? Continue to sit on your blessed assurances or serve Christ? I know that's a hard pill and bitter pill to swallow, but to God be the glory. Give God some glory right now. Come on. But let us review. Let us review. Who quits on Jesus? Who does that? People do when they're confronted with hardship. They want to conform at first, but when things get tough, they quit because they have to give up those comforts. You know, I, I remember when I was in the Marines. Randy, one of the things we always had to do was uh, go to the field. And we were in the field in the rain, we were in the field in the snow, we were in the field in the heat, we were in the jungle, we were in the desert, we were in the Arctic. Everywhere I ever went, it was not comfortable. It was cold, either extremely hot, or extremely just nasty and wet. But we had no comfort. Same thing with Christ. When you serve in Christ, you'll get comfort, but you get God glory every time. Look at the second point. Who quits on Christ? People do when hindrances occur. They first make excuses because their priorities aren't godly. But lastly, lastly, who quits on Jesus? People who are filled with hesitation. Hesitation. They have no dedication and they have no direction in their lives. Have mercy. 
People quit on Jesus because they are filled with hesitation. They have no dedication and they have no direction in their lives. Look at verses 61 and 62. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my home, at my house. And Jesus said to, unto him, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Look at that hesitation. Another man, like the first one, comes up and volunteers and wants to commit to service for the Lord. But his butt gets in the way. I'm not making this up. Look at the text. He says, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell. His butt gets in the way. That's hesitation. I want to follow you, Lord, but I got to go say goodbye to those people back at the house. You do know the people in your family aren't going to help you. They are a distraction to you. Everyone back at the Ponderosa don't have the same priorities, the same love. Some of the folks don't love or know Jesus. As a matter of fact, some of those old habits and bad friends may distract you from service for Christ. Jesus warns his followers and future believers that the people of your own household will even be a distraction to you and they may even become your enemies he tells us that in Matthew the 10th chapter Jesus said I have come to set man against his father a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be those in his own household Jesus goes on to say he who loves the father or their mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You see, when Jesus said that, he was warning everyone that family, friends, even your community can and will become a distraction and cause you to hesitate, cause you to reconsider your dedication to following Jesus. Jesus was saying, if you go home to say goodbye, you're not going to come back and follow me because you're not dedicated nor committed to me. You're distracted by what's behind you and not the future in front of you. Jesus said, he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose his life. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it again. When your priorities are misguided, confused, it will weaken your dedication to the cause of Christ and cause you to become lost and lose your direction. Look at verse 62 again. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Fit. Fit means able to serve. Fit means you are capable to serve. Fit means you are willing to serve. When Jesus said that to this man and to everyone that was listening, they totally understood what he was saying. They got a mental picture of a farmer plowing because of the distractions by looking back. The roads were crooked and misshapen. Nancy, if you would, please. I used to teach agriculture when I was back at the school of McLean. And one of the best things about my job was I got to ride a nice John Deere tractor, this big old machine. And I would run it up and down, tearing up the soil and make it nice furrow rows. Now, mind you, the first time I did it, it wasn't straight. It was all crooked. But then after time, after time, after practice, after practice, I got those rows straight. Because sometimes I got distracted by the traffic, by people, by people on the radio calling, all kind of things. But look again. Nancy, throw that up there real quick. Everyone understood Jesus' metaphor and pictured the crooked, disordered field because you are looking back and not looking forward at the work you're supposed to be doing. It has become a hot mess. Throw that back up there one more time, Nancy. The next slide. Thank you. Right there. You see how it's crooked right there? It has become a hot mess because you're looking back 
crooked and misshapen in disorder and disarray. Now I'm going to say that word again. Does that describe anybody's life right now? Because they don't have Christ in your life right now. Your life has become crooked, misshapen, disordered, and in total disarray because you have put Christ on the back burner because you have made Christ second and not number one in your life because you put the priorities of this world before the Lord. When a person returns home and goes back to a family reunion or a high school reunion, things look a little smaller sometimes. Things that were important are now unimportant. Or maybe sometimes it goes just the opposite. You become distracted by those old friends, that local bar, those old habits and old ways creep back and begin to tempt you. What Jesus was telling the young man, if you go home, you won't come back. You can't serve home. They may persuade you to rethink your decision to follow me. You can't serve the world and God at the same time, brothers and sisters. You can't serve two masters. You'll either love one or hate the other. You see, Brother Charlie, a double-minded man is unstable and confused and distracted in all his ways and unable to serve God. That's why Jesus used the word fit to serve. Everyone wants Jesus, must follow Jesus, must be totally dedicated, must be totally focused on the direction that Jesus is going in and follow him. Jesus is asking you, Jesus is asking me, are you going to get off the fence and follow or be unstable and wallow back and forth? You can't let this world, you can't let your community, your political affiliation and your family distract you from following Christ. Your direction, your purpose, your loyalty. Somebody say his sweet name with me. Somebody say Jesus. It is to follow Jesus. When you and I became a Christian, we decided that we are going to follow Jesus. There is no turning back. There is no turning back. The cross before you, the world behind you, no turning back, no turning back. Your life application, my friends, is your personal relationship with Christ must be number one priority over family. I love my wife, but my wife will tell you that I love my Lord. You got to put it over your friends, your community, even over your country because we serve a heavenly kingdom. We are in service for the Lord. Randy, you know the main reason why people have quit on Jesus these days? It's because they don't want to do what Jesus has planned for them. They're being disobedient in their life. And the problem is, we want our will to be done. Our wants, our needs, our desires to be done here on earth and not God's. You see, Deb, when God's will is done, we get mad. We get mad because we feel that God has disappointed us, that God has let us down. God shouldn't have done the things he did this way. God doesn't love me. If God really loved me, he wouldn't have let me lose my job. He wouldn't have let that loved one in my life die. He wouldn't let sickness take my body. He wouldn't let this disease hurt me. God wouldn't let pain fill my, fill my body day and night. I wouldn't experience loss. I wouldn't experience heartache. I I wouldn't experience loneliness. I wouldn't experience sadness and disappointment and depression. But let me be clear about one thing. Everything that we've gone through, my Savior, your Savior went through too. On the night in which he was betrayed, his, his disciples abandoned him. They beat him and brutalized him. He felt pain. He felt loneliness. He felt sorrow and heartache as well. So he understands what you are feeling and going through. I said it before and I said it again. You're not alone in this fight. We serve a God who cares about us. Margie, when he created everything, can the creation tell the creator, I'm disappointed in you? Can we look to God and say, I'm mad at you, I'm ashamed of you? Or God, you could have done a better job? Or God, you shouldn't have hurt me like that? I'm going to say this again. If anyone had a reason to complain, it might have been that guy named Job. Y'all remember Job, right? He 
could have quit on God. But you know what Job decided to do instead? He decided to praise God. In all that Job went through, he lost everything, but he still praised God. But lastly, lastly, before we go home, in the sixth chapter of the book of John, Jesus confronts disciples. He confronts all the followers, all the people hanging on, hanging out around him. Because you know when Jesus traveled everywhere he went, there was a large crowd always following. But in this chapter, Jesus says some hard things. The difficulties that will happen when Jesus put these people to the test, not even a hard test, just a strong comment about commitment. The scripture says the following. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Meaning, they quit on Jesus. But then Jesus goes on and turns to the twelve. And I can just picture with my sanctified imagination. He turned and pointed to them. Do you also want to go away? But they didn't quit on Jesus when it got hard. Trust me, brothers and sisters. Hard tests and trials and tribulations are coming. Even they haven't even come yet. We haven't even experienced the real. You thought COVID was something? Huh. There's some stuff coming down the road here someday soon that we all going to have to deal with. We're all going to have to struggle. But we have a helper and a savior named Jesus. So who gives up and quits on Jesus? Who does it? Peter boldly answers for the 12 and says, Lord, whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe, that's what he says, Peter says, and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now, the question I have for you today, brothers and sisters, is this. It's for me and for you. I have this for you. Who quits on Jesus? Who does that? Somebody say, not me. And you need to believe that for yourself. Please rise to your feet.